I want to uh, share this morning, and honestly, I started, I think, uh, gosh, probably about a month ago or more, really talking about uh, the called, the chosen, and the faithful, but I really want to get into the called and the gift that is on the inside of every one of us, what the Holy Spirit has put in us, actually before the foundation of the world, and what I believe the Spirit of God is going to do in these last days. So, Father, we thank you so much for your truth, and we thank you for your anointing in this house. Holy Spirit, we call upon you. Breathe on us. Breathe in us new revelation of who we are in Christ, our gifts. I thank you for the spirit of boldness and life permeating through us to this world. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, there'll be a release in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read a scripture, John 1.17. It says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How many know the law was all about performance? You had, so, you know, you had 400 and something laws. Aren't you glad you don't have to keep the law? Oh, my goodness. It was impossible to keep. And what it showed them was a need for a Savior. The only way that it was going to happen was we're going to have to have grace, and we're going to have to have a lot of it. But it came in Jesus Christ, and it says that Jesus came, and he brought grace, and he brought truth. So when I look at that, I see that we really, in this, we see two major encounters that Jesus wants to have in our life. The first one is an encounter with grace. you got to have the encounter with grace. And you say, well, what is grace? It's love eternal. It's love unending. The love of Jesus comes in your life, totally radically shakes your world. And that is an encounter. It's interesting because the word in the English, the word encounter, actually means unexpected. It's really like you're, you're living your life and then all of a sudden, man, bam. You are in a service or somehow God comes on you and ministers to you. And I have seen that happening. We have some people in this church that the Lord just visited in a dream. And an individual driving by, and, and the Lord spoke to his heart, go to that church. Get in that church. He got filled with the Holy Spirit, got radically changed. And there's been others who've been coming by. Bless them. Let them read 167 every time they come by here. I pray they read the word impact, and they realize God wants to impact them. Now, the encounter, of course, look. I think about what is about to happen, and it, the date is June when, when they come. June what? June 17th and 18th. Do you know those who are hungry and thirsty are the ones God fills? And if you will pray, how many of you, to, just to be honest, say, you know, I, I, I need just a new refreshing and a new renewal in the spirit and presence of God. Yes. Well, in that, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. James says this, draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. So there is a responsibility. God can impact an individual right where they are. Where they are and that happens. It happened to Saul on the road to Damascus. But the majority of the time when it happens, it happens because we seek him. And because that we are hungry for him. So I pray that you'll do this. Because I know the Spirit of God's already spoken some things in my heart where that meeting is concerned. Number one, start interceding for it. And prepare yourself to be ministered to. We all need it. And God wants to do it. So when these opportunities are here, please don't pass them by. My goodness, if you have to take off do it those are those are the things that god sees in offerings to the lord when you know and when you study the the prophets what they did is they built altars to god and they called on the name of the lord and the lord came in visitation but it took the offering they built an altar and they laid their sacrifices before god and then god comes and 
Because why? They gave of themselves. God wasn't asking them to do it. They did it as unto the Lord because they needed God for a miracle in their life. And miracles don't come until you need it. They won't. But when you are hungry and you need a miracle, and you call upon him, he will answer and show you great and mighty things. He'll do it. But there is a time right now. America, we're blessed. We haven't been impacted so much as a lot of the world. But what's happening, that's coming to our door. And many times we don't respond until it impacts us personally. Then we feel the pain and we respond. But, you know, here's the thing. I, that's, not the, the perp, that's not the will of God is for all hell to break loose, and then you cry to him. Now, he'll answer. But the truth is what God wants is for us to walk in relationship with him and walk into a continual uh, ministry of him, and that comes to the encounter of truth. You've got the encounter of grace, and then you've got the encounter of truth. And so as I was thinking about this uh, the other day, I just, I wrote this down. Encounter with grace is an encounter with Jesus, which equals change, which equals ministry. You will never find, you just won't find it. You will not find where an encounter with Jesus was all about just giving you goosebumps, making your hair stand up, you know, on its ends. No, it may do that. But it's always to move you into ministry. Encounters come to change us, to release us into ministry. What happened to uh, Saul of Tarsus once he said, man, I, you know, I see the Lord. He asked, what do you want me to do? The same thing with Isaiah. When Isaiah saw the Lord and he said he was in his temple and he saw the glory of God strangest thing that God asked who will go for us now you almost want to say God give me a break who needs to go for you you're God but here's the thing we have to understand God is sovereign but he has chosen to sovereignly act according to his word he can't violate his word the the heavens are the Lord's but the earth he has given to the children of men so God is asking, who will, Isaiah, will you go and be my voice? And Isaiah, of course, fell on his face, and he said, Lord, send me. When the anointing of God hits you, can I tell you what you're going to say? God, send me. It so impacts you that you're filled with joy, you're filled with life, you have an understanding of his grace, and you want to release that grace. But here's the key to stay in that anointing you've got to have an encounter with truth. And here it is. Encounter with truth is a daily encounter with the Word, which equals transformation, which equals maturity. Everybody getting this? Absolutely. Because when we daily feed off the Word of God, and we make this a priority, because this is the Word of life. I don't know if the Bible... Jesus is the Word, so I don't know if we will actually have this book. I don't doubt, I really, honestly, I believe it will be there. I believe we'll use it during the millennial reign to preach and continue to teach. But you have to understand, you know, this is the number one selling book in the world and always has been. And it's in, gosh, maybe 500, 600 translations. Is that not crazy? And it's gone all over the world. You know why? Because it's life. And we have to hunger and thirst after it. Kim and I were in uh, the nation of Hungary. And uh, it was before the, the Iron Curtain fell and the walls all came down. And so they were under communistic rule. And I remember when we went into that nation, Bill Gregory, who was the missionary, was with us, and he told us, he said, and he was, it's funny, he was filling our suitcases full of Bibles, just packing Kim's and mine, and, and I'm saying, now, don't we have to go through security? He goes, oh, absolutely. I said, now, 
they're communists, right? He goes, yeah. And I said, well, aren't they going to see the Bibles? He goes, no, nah, don't worry about it. The Holy Ghost always blinds their eyes. Yes, but I don't think I've ever done that. He goes, oh, you'll have fun. Don't worry about it. So, man, he's just packing Bibles all in my suitcase. And he said, let's just throw the clothes over it. And it was funny, sure enough. It was crazy. They opened my suitcase, and I'm going, I love you, Jesus. I worship you. <laughs> and move on, move on. I don't know how many Bibles we had, but the thing about it, Bill told me, he said, I brought the first box of Bibles to these people, and he said, they fell at my feet, and they kissed my feet. And he said, you cannot imagine what that meant to them to have the Word of God under the restraint of the communist regime. That's how important God's Word is to us. It's life. It's everything. Let's have an encounter with grace. That's what we need right now, a new encounter with grace that's going to release us, going to change us, release us to ministry. But also, thank God, let's get in the Word and let's be transformed into maturity. Now, your talent is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. Now, you have received a gift. I'm going to read a uh, couple of scriptures that I went over, I think, probably a month ago or, or so, but I want you to see these again. This scripture is one of these scriptures that really will, it'll wake you up in the middle of the night when you look at the truth of it. For it is he who has delivered us and saved us and called us with a calling in itself holy and leading to holiness. So everybody say this with me. I'm delivered. I am saved, and I am called. Look at your neighbor and say, you're called. Now, when we look at the word, word calling, we think, here's, here's the thing, the first thing we think, we think, well, Pastor Terry, you're called. We know Philip and Sherry, they're called. We know Matt and Becca, they're called. But you guys walk in, in an office of the fivefold ministry, so that is where the calling is. No, the calling is not just on us. It's on every one of us. You are called, and the beauty of this word, it is not just like me, you know, calling, oh, will somebody come up here and help me? No, it is the call of God. The word called means to be called out by name. That means when God calls, he says, Angelita. He doesn't say somebody else's name. Why? Because he knows Angelita. He has put things on the inside of her that he didn't put in me. But there's a uniqueness. And so what this does, this just changes everything because what it does, it makes it very intentional and it makes it very personal. You are all called. Now, we can say, well, we're not called, but that's, the Bible says you're called. You have been called out by God. If you're born again and you have Jesus in your life, there is something he has on the inside of you. And what you do when you discover your gift, you realize it's never been for you anyway. It's for someone else. It's all about touching someone else. Releasing your gift and recognizing your gift. Let me continue reading. I love this. For he did it not because of anything of merit that we have done. Nothing we can do. We didn't do anything to get God to put these gifts in us. God is the one who put them in us. And it said because, because of and to father, notice this, to father his purpose and grace, his unmerited favor. In other words, he wants to individually impact your life to further what? His purpose. To waken up in us his purpose. So that we see, you know, you know what we get eyes for? We get eyes for the harvest. And when you get eyes for the harvest, you get a compassion for the harvest. And then you'll release what is in you to do what? To touch the harvest. 
Everything, that's why Jesus told the apostles, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, you know, come on. I can't go into all the world. I live in Arkansas, so there's no way I can go to every nation of the world. But when you study that out, he's, he, what he's really saying is you go into your world and you preach. Your life is a sermon whether you know it or not. Everything you do is ministering life to the people around you. You are the light that is penetrating the darkness, and all hell right now is breaking out. There is a war in the heavenlies of darkness and light, and it is coming to a head. And how many of you know who's going to win? The light's going to win. Light always expels darkness. And it says here, so his grace comes on us to do it which was given us in Christ Jesus. Now, notice this before the world began. Oh, wow. You mean to tell me that before God ever said, light be, God knew who we were, I mean, planned us, purposed us, and took us and put us in this generation? When he could have put us in any generation, but he didn't. Why? Because of his plan and his purpose. You are here, here right now by the purpose of God. Matter of fact, God saw this service before any of us were ever born or ever the earth was ever created. He saw it. He knew every one of you who was going to be here. But here is the thing. Now it's up to me to do what? To grab hold of his grace and allow an encounter to come, a new refreshing of Jesus and his beauty. And you say, Pastor Terry, that's great. I just don't know how to get that. Honey, go fall on your face and just begin to worship. And Kim can, can tell you this. There's many, many days I have walked in, and I, I'll, I would tell her, I'll see you in about an hour. And I'm going in my prayer room. I'm going to lay on that floor and I'm going to worship. Whenever problems, things, you know, the first thing is you go to him. And one day I remember it was just a lot of stress. And we were running our missions department. It just seemed like all hell was breaking loose. And I came in and I just fell on my face in my prayer closet. And I, really, I just began to break. I said, you know, it, 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 I can't do this. There, we don't have the means, the finances. We don't have what, what all it's going to take. It is, seems the things that we got are falling apart. Man, I just broke. And I remember in my heart, I just said, Lord, I know you're standing before me. And I reached out with my hands. And I, and I grabbed his ankles and I said, I just worship you. I just worship you. And I said, and I lay every bit of it before your feet, and I just worship you. And it was sometimes late, sometime later, I was reading in one of the Gospels, when Jesus appeared before them after he was raised from the dead. And you know what it said? They fell at his feet, and they grabbed his ankles. And they worshiped him. Why? Because they had an encounter with Jesus. The Lord wants to bring you into a new encounter. God cannot do it by himself. He just can't. That's the way he's chosen. He releases people. When you look at David, and I've always thought about this, and I thought, you know, here's Goliath standing up there just saying, you know, give me a man, give me a man, give me a man, give me a man. Forty days and forty nights, that giant stood up and just telling Israel, Send me a man, and we'll serve you. If he kills me, if I kill him, you know, then we'll serve you guys. But here's the thing. And I'm sitting there reading that story one day, and I thought, God, why didn't you just fry that dude? That would have been a great story. A lightning bolt just comes from heaven, there's a little piece of charcoal. <laughs> I thought, now that would be a good story. But you know what? Why was Goliath saying, send me a man? Because Satan knows that if God does something, it has to come through man. God didn't strike him down. No, 
what did God do? God sent him a boy with faith. You just, you just got to love God and the way he does things. And, you know, you've, some of you have heard me tell this, but I love David. Oh, my gosh, when he stood up to, with the giant, you had, we all have to understand this kid had been in the shepherd's field. He was a, he was a marksman with the slingshot. It says in the scriptures his mighty men could sling the slingshot to a hair's breadth. That means they used it as a weapon. They were marksmen. Well, where did they learn that from? David, man. David said, we're, I'm going to school you boys today in the slingshot. And you know why? They were all going, yeah, we want to watch him because we know who he killed. And when David stood before Goliath, everybody was seeing this great giant. And David's sitting there going, I've never seen a head that big. There's no way I can miss that head. I can't miss it. It's too big. Big as a milk bucket. Dear Lord, I can bust the head. And, and so the faith of that young kid, but he also knew his ability, and he knew what his skills were and his giftings were, and God anointed his giftings to slay the giant. God wants to anoint you in your giftings to go slay this culture, this demonic culture in this world. And it's not about Jesus coming and just jerking us off this planet. No, he'll come when he's ready. What God wants to do is get on the planet, his anointing to come through us, because in the anointing you can slay giants. I tell you, when the anointing hits you, it's like, where is the giant? Something changes in us, and that's called encounter. So, and this was put in us before the world or time began. So we're right here. I was reading the book of John the other day, and uh, I just reread the miracle of the water. And when Mary came to, it was the first miracle Jesus did. As a matter of fact, she really put him in the position that he said, you're pushing me before my time. Because he knew once this power is released, you're not going to put it back in a box. And what she said to him, she came and said to him, said the, the, the master of the feast, of this marriage feast, they have run out of wine. And he said, well, what's that got to do with me? And she said, you need to do something. And so, interesting, she went over to the men, the servants with water pots, and says, whatever he says, that is what you do. And he goes over. Then the, the, the master of the feast makes the most prophetic statement when he said this right here. Most people wait at the end of the wedding feast when people have been, you know, a little intoxicated or whatever. They had too much or they've had enough and they give the old stuff. But man, you're giving out the new wine. This is fresh. Now that's prophetic. God always saves the best for last. He does. And I want that to encourage you today. He saves the best for last. Now here we go. I mean, this is going to nail all of us. First Peter 4.10, our gifts, let me, let me read it here. As each of you has received a gift, look at your neighbor and say, you received a gift. Now, notice this, a particular spiritual talent. There is a talent you may have, but I want you to know that it is spiritual. The whole, in other words, the Holy Spirit has anointed you for that. It's a gracious, divine endowment. Now, he says, now employ it for one another as befits good trustees. So what am I to do with that gift? Who is it for? It's for someone else. I am to employ the gift for someone else. It's going to benefit others, but I am a trustee of God's many-sided grace. I am a steward. We have to be faithful stewards of the extremely diverse powers and gifts granted to, uh, granted to Christians by His unmerited favor. Now, I want to make this statement. Our gifts are not intended to be platforms where we try to gain our sense of significance from the esteem of men. Our real significance comes from God choosing us in Christ 
gifting us, deploying us in his kingdom for his purposes. There's more significance there than we can fully comprehend and appreciate. Amen. Number two here, we know that we have gifts. Number two, we have to activate the gifts. Now, for the kingdom of heaven, Jesus, Matthew 25, it's very interesting because it's fallen right in line with Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is all about the end of the world. Well, you have to understand Jesus didn't stop in the end of Matthew 24. No, he goes in to Matthew 25. And he talks about the talents. He talks about the virgins. He talks about the end time. He is continuing in both. So you have to put this in the context of where it is set. And so he's talking about himself when he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to each according to their own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. So here's the question. Who gave out the gifts? God did. God gave out the gifts. So it doesn't do he gave out the talents, some five, some two, and some one. So God gives out the talents. So it doesn't do me any good to look over at Philip and say, why didn't God give me as many gifts as he got? He got five, I only got two. No. You know what God wants you to do? Use what you got. Because you know what? God always multiplies. That's a fact. Uh, my brother, my older brother's not here this morning, but, and of course my family was all here a couple of weeks ago. But when we would have Christmas, when my mom and dad were alive, my mother would take a hat. I don't know how many grandchildren there are. But she would take a hat or, or take a box, and she would write all the names of the kids and the grandchildren, and she would just put it in a box, and then she would draw the names out for who's going to buy someone a gift. And so that at the family Christmas, everybody got one gift. That was it. So you know you could afford Christmas. How many of you know that? So... We, at the fam we do this every year, and so we were getting, and we put all the gifts out, and I will never forget, my twin brother, his name actually accidentally got in there twice. And he got two gifts, and I only got one. Now, if you, how many know, if you know anything about twins, we got a major problem here. <laughs> so I remember I opened my gift, and it was a tie, but I laughed. And, and my brother said that he leaned, <laughs> leaned over and said, that's an ugly tie. <laughs> and I, I was like, Jerry, have mercy on me. Swap with me. You got two gifts. And he said, I'm not giving you nothing. Y'all need to pray for his selfish soul. <laughs> but the funny thing is, what happens when we have encounters with the Lord God begins to reveal a compassion for certain things. And sometimes if we're not, we're not careful, we start comparing. We run over and go, what would you get? Oh, my gosh. Apostle, what would you get? Prophet, what would you get? Teacher. And then you look at your gift and you go, server? I don't think I like that gift. I think I'll swap that. No, we don't get into gift swapping. We are not here to compete. We are here to complete. We are here to flow together. You have a gifting. I have a gifting. And we find those giftings in our journey with the Lord. So, so what happens here, and he goes on and he says, and then he that had received five talents went and traded with them and made five more. And then likewise, he that had two went and traded. And then it says here, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. We will never stand before the white throne judgment. That is for sinners. It is not for Christians. But every Christian goes before the judgment seat of Christ where we will be judged 
and he will judge fairly. What have you done with the gifts and the calling I've given you? How have you impacted people, and did you do it in my heart and my spirit and in the right way? And the Bible's very, very clear. Paul said this, that when we stand before him, if, it, if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it'll be consumed by fire. If it's gold, silver, and precious jewels, you'll receive a reward. Now, what Jesus, and the thing that, that is, the thing about the Lord and about our gifts, again, it is not about performance. It's really just tapping into his grace and using what you got and, and just letting his love flow through you. I mean, picking up the phone, and just saying, I'm going to call someone and just see how they're doing and pray for them. You know, you didn't do that because you had an inspiration of God. You just did it because you have Christian love for one another. Those are the, 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 the jewels and the precious things that the Lord sees. And what happened, he goes ahead, and of course you know the story. He says to them, they go up, and I, I'm not going to read all the scripture, but they go up and they stand before him. He that had five he gave five more. He was faithful. And listen to what he said. Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, doesn't that sound cool? All right. He that had received two talents. Lord, you delivered me two talents. Go ahead and put up the next scripture. And the Lord said to him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you really ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, hang on. What did he say to the person that had five talents? And what did he say to the person that had two talents? Said the same thing. The absolute same thing. God will not require of us something that we're not called to do. But what the encounter of Jesus and what God's going to do in our lives you get so filled with his love that you can't help but do something for him. You just can't. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, close this out here in about five minutes, but let me just share this with you, when, what happened to me one time. I, uh, I was reading Revelation 22, verse 12, and it says, Behold, I'm qu coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. And I remember that morning when I was reading that scripture, I just stopped and I said to the Lord, I said, get me ready for heaven. Just get me ready for heaven. I mean, if you ask the Lord to do something like that, get ready, he's going to get you ready. He's going to do something. So it was on a Saturday about two weeks later, and I jumped up and I had to get the yard done. It was starting to rain. And so I, don't, I can't exactly remember either Kim's car was parked, parked, behind mine I couldn't get mine out and so I grabbed her car and I took off to the to the store real quick because I had to get a couple of things so I could mow and do some things and when I got in the car and took off uh, the gas tank said zero my wife's the only person who she drives by faith and uh, uh, she she tricked a car one time that it went from zero to full it did automatically. It, it was so empty it went back to full. But but uh, anyway, so I was a little irritated. I was like, ah, Kim, ah. So I pull in this gas station real quick. Now it's starting to rain. I'm in a hurry. I'm pumping gas in the car, and I'm thinking, I've got to get to the store. i got to get this done. And all of a sudden, somebody goes, taps on my shoulder, and I turn around probably about a 16, 17-year-old young lady, and she's crying. And she said, can you please help me? And I said to her, well, what, what's wrong? She said, I've walked in the rain, and I only have $6 worth of food stamps. We have no food, and they will not take, they will not take it at the grocery store. And I said to her, absolutely, I'll help you. Get in the car, get out of the rain, let me fill this up, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you to the grocery store. But when I was finishing, you know, and of course, the Lord, you know how God, he's like, remember what you prayed the other day? I said, yeah, I got it. I got this. 
So I get in the car, and I knew I only had a few minutes at the grocery store, so I talked to talking to her about the Lord, and come find out, it's amazing. Uh, she was from the same denomination at the time I was in, or I'd come from, and, and she was away from the Lord, so I just began to minister to her. And then when I pulled up to the grocery store, I knew what I was supposed to do. I just looked at her, and I said, okay, come on in, I'm buying you groceries. And she said, you're doing what? I said, I'm buying you groceries, come on, let's go. So I, 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 I take her, and she was walking behind me, sir, what are you doing? I said, don't worry about it, honey, I'm buying you groceries. Let's get a basket. And then I looked at her, and I said, now, what do you want? And she, she just looked at me. I said, well, do you need cereal? And she goes, uh-huh. So we went to the cereal aisle, and I said, sweetheart, what do you want? And, and, and how many have been, been to the cereal aisle lately? I mean, and, and she finally said, well, I'll take some Cheerios. And so I said, what do you want, honey nut, frosted, or plain? What, what kind do you want? And finally she pointed at the honey nut. So I put two or three boxes in there. We went, and it was so funny. I took her to every aisle, and I just said, what do you want? Just tell me what you want. And we went to the, get milk, we went to get meat, and I, I bought her wonderful, I filled that basket completely up. And we get to the counter, and the lady's running it through, and I'll never forget, she tapped on my shoulder, and she said, do you want my food stamps? And I said, sweetheart, I don't need your food stamps. I got her out in the car, and then I looked at her, and I said, now, why did I do that for you? And she said, well, was it because you felt sorry for me? I said, no, it wasn't because I felt sorry for you. God destined this whole thing. He loves you, and he is showing you. You came with $6 worth of food stamps, and look what you got. You got enough food to last you a month. And she began to cry, and I said, God loves you so much that the Lord set this whole thing up. God knew that Kim was going to drive the car to zero. <laughs> so he, he put it all set up. See, when you ask the Lord to use you, all of a sudden, all these things start happening in the heavenlies because you are awakening God in you. And God loves people. And God's going to use you. And so I took her to the apartment, put all the groceries around her feet. We prayed, and I left. And when I left, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I'm going to tell you two things, and don't you ever forget it. Number one, you taking her to that grocery store, there's really no reward in that because you did it because you were asked. But when you took that girl in that grocery store, that is what is gold, jewel, and precious stones to me. You did that out of you. And then the second thing he said to me, he said, I want to remind my church of this right here. God's abundance is more than we can ever, ever conceive. And sometimes we're just like, oh, God, give me a box of cereal. And God's saying, what do you want? Honey nut frosted or plain? What are your desires? We're all made different. We all have desires. We all have things. God not only wants to meet our needs, but he wants to supply for us finances and blessings so we have to give to the harvest and to bless people. And sometimes we, we go short because we think, oh, you know, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that'll be, or I've got a mansion over the hilltop. And, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, in the sweet by and by, it's going to be wonderful. But, you know, how many know you need it in the, in the sweet now and now? You got it in the by and by, but it's not the by and by. We need heaven on earth. And heaven on earth is Jehovah Jireh, the God that's more than enough. But what does it, how does it happen? It happens when we use what we got to bless someone else. And when you do that and you, you know, you want to get involved in this church, all you got to do is come up to Kim, come up to Christy, and say, what can I do to help? And they'll put you to work. And everybody knows this. If you start complaining around here, that's your calling. <laughs> so if you, you want to complain, then you just got blessed. You are blessed to do it. But here's the thing. Here it is. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever you put your hand to, 
God multiplies. Whatever your hand finds to do, you do it with all your might. Church cannot function without sound people. It cannot function without the music people. It cannot function without the video. It cannot function without the nursery and stuff like that. And people sometimes are coming up, oh, I'm just ready for ministry. Ready for ministry. Open your eyes, find a need, and fill it. And do it as unto the Lord. Don't complain. Go through the hard time. Stay in the encounter of truth. And you'll learn how to submit to authority. You'll learn how to flow and do it in the right heart. But you get ready. What do we need right now? We need a new encounter of grace. We do. And you get ready. Heaven is about to explode on this earth. Oh, man. And you know who he's after? after you and he's going to show himself he's going to reveal himself and he's going to use you to bring in his harvest stand up with me father we bless you we thank you so much we thank you jesus for all that you've done all the goodness and the truth of your word i thank you holy spirit oh father Give us eyes for the harvest. Let us see people. Open our hearts. Oh, Father, give us a new spirit of intercession in us and a compassion. I thank you, Holy Spirit, oh, for just the release in us. Get us ready for heaven. Get us ready for heaven. Oh, I pray that. Let me say this. The first way to get ready for heaven is to know Jesus as your Lord. And if you don't know him as your Lord today, here is an opportunity to get Jesus in your heart. His grace, he is there. The first thing the Spirit of God said in that scripture, I, I delivered you and I called you. Deliverance comes first, then calling comes second. God is here to deliver you. God is here to set you free. God is here to heal you in any area of your life. I want uh, the elders to come and join me the, this morning, and we're going we're gonna to open up these altars, whatever you need today. Uh, St St Steve, I don't know.